Hi, we're Red Place. Bringing you English, Maths, Science and 11 plus activities from Key Stages 1 to 4. We're bringing live English, Maths and Science lessons into your homes during the school closure period, so why not join us over the next few weeks as we tackle some key topics. You might find it useful to have a pen and paper handy as we go so that you can make a note of key ideas or jot things down. So, welcome to today's science lesson on friction with Mr. Barclay. By the end of today's lesson, we're aiming to have achieved either one or all of the following three steps. To understand that friction is a type of force and how it is caused. To apply your understanding to an example question and to explain this idea to someone else. So friction, what's that about? Well, first of all, friction is a type of force. Just to remind you, a force is a push or a pull, and that means they act in two directions. Like when you push your chair in under your desk and you can feel the floor making it difficult. Or maybe you're trying to open a nice cool can of drink. You have to pull quite hard on the ring. These forces act in opposite directions. Seeing forces can be quite tough and you may need to use a bit of imagination, but maybe this could help. If you're sitting on a chair, your downward force or weight is caused by gravity. So what's stopping you falling to the ground? Huh, the chair. So weirdly, that must mean that the chair is providing an upward force to balance your weight pushing down. That's why you stay on the chair. If you don't believe me, just try this. Blow up a balloon Place it on the chair and slowly sit on it. Watch what happens to the balloon. Try to explain why that's happening using this idea of opposing forces. So, that was a reminder of forces because we're looking at friction and that's a type of force. It's a force that occurs between two surfaces that are touching each other, so it's a type of contact force. For example, there's friction between your trainers and the ground. You push against the ground when you walk and friction stops your trainers sliding backwards. When you're swimming, you push against the water and the friction between the two enables you to have enough pushing force to move forward. Your bike brakes squeeze against the wheel and the friction between the brakes and the wheel causes your bike to slow down and incidentally, this produces a lot of heat so the brakes get hot. If you want lots of friction, you need good grip. Let's imagine that there was no grip between your trainers and the ground. What would happen when you tried to walk? Well, when you push backwards against the ground in order to walk forwards, your shoe just slides backwards and you go nowhere. You want good grip with your trainers. That's lots of friction. Then when you push against the ground to move forwards, you don't just stay in the same place. How do you get good grip with your shoes? Well, there's three things in particular. The sole of your shoe is made of rubber, which is a high friction material. This gives you good grip. Then the tread pattern on your sole isn't smooth, is it? It's got lots of knobbly bits to help grip the surface you're walking on. Finally, you have contact. That's the sole of your trainer. If you've ever walked on the pavement in football boots where the studs give you a tiny area of contact, you'll know what I mean. However, sometimes you want very little friction, but you'd never want none. If you were sledging down a hill without friction, you wouldn't be able to stop. Ah! If you're moving over a slippery surface like ice or snow, you probably want to move fast. And so you want low friction. How does that work? Well, take these ice skates. The blades are in contact with the ice and they're made of smooth metal. That creates very little friction. Not only that, but the blades are very narrow so there's only a tiny area touching the ice. These both ensure little friction and so lots of speed. So let's have a quick recap. Friction is a force between two surfaces that are touching each other. If we need more friction, then we use gripping materials like rubber. 
we make sure the surfaces in contact with each other are pretty large. And we also make sure that those surfaces are rough and knobbly, like mountain bike tyres on a forest track. So, now we come to something new, friction in air and water. Remember, even the air is touching you, and if you were a pigeon, you'd be using friction between your wings and the air to hold you up and fly around. Now, friction between you and the air, say, when you're riding your bike and you can feel the wind in your face, that's called air resistance. Then, if you're swimming, you're pushing against the water in order to move. Guess what that's called? Yeah, that's right, water resistance. So, what we've got here is friction, and when it's between an object like you and something like water or air, it's called resistance. But it's still friction, really. Now, quite often, things need to move quickly through the water or the air. They need to reduce the resistance by pushing the air or water out of the way more easily. One way they do this is to be streamlined. That means they have a smooth surface and a pointy shape. The car can slip through the air more easily, and the dolphin can swim through the water more easily because they're both streamlined with smooth, pointy shapes. So, let's have a quick recap of where we've got to. Friction is that force between two surfaces that are touching, even air and water. And if we want to reduce the friction, then we need a smooth, streamlined shape that pushes the air or water out of the way more easily. Next, the areas in contact want to be small, which is where the pointy shape really helps. And finally, the surface needs to be smooth. A dolphin skin is very smooth, and so are the wings of a plane. Okay, the next thing we're doing is to use an EdPlace activity to practice the work we've been doing on friction. You'll need to sign into your EdPlace account, or if you don't have an account, simply go to www.edplace.com. On the next slide is the activity to work through, and then we'll get back together to have a look at a few of the questions, all right? So, the activity we're going to work through is called Friction Checkup. And whether you have an EdPlace account or not, the route to find it is pretty similar. If you have an account, click on the Science set of activities and follow the route through to Friction Checkup. If you don't have an account, select the Learn tab on the EdPlace website, and then follow through Science, Year 5 Activities, and then the National Curriculum tab. Next, select Forces and find the group of activities relating to resistance and friction. When you open those up, you should select Friction Checkup and you're good to go. We'll just check that you're in the right place on the next slide. If the introduction you can see matches this screenshot, you're in the right place, Friction Checkup. If not, Whiz back to the previous slide and make sure you followed each of those steps to get here. Once you can see this, you're ready to start. Simply pause this video, work through the activity, and when you've finished, come back to my lesson here and we'll look at three of the questions. Have fun and see you later. Right, so this first question is simply checking that you've taken on board the key aspects of what increases the force of friction between two surfaces. The introduction will have reminded you, so hopefully you nailed these okay. If the surfaces rubbing against each other are rough, like your trainers on the path, then there's lots of friction. Similarly, if they're bumpy, like the tread on the sole of your trainers, more friction. Finally, bigger areas provide a larger surface to come into contact with. For example, tank tracks have a much bigger surface area touching the ground than tyres would have. So that means lots more friction. The other two answers, streamlining and smoothness, are to do with reducing friction rather than increasing it. Does that all make sense? OK, let's move on. Now, with this second question, we're still looking at increasing friction, but it's the air resistance type of friction, where the surface of the car is rubbing against the air as it's trying to push the air out of the way as it drives through it. Now, looking at the shape of the car, you can see that it's streamlined, that means it's designed to push through the air with less resistance. So what about if a flat front, like a lorry? Lots of resistance. The shape also says it's a fast car. 
Now, as it speeds up, it's got to push more and more air out of the way faster and faster. So speed also increases the air resistance of the car. Finally, what if the car was covered in grass or fur? Would that make it faster or slower? Of course, it's polished to reduce air resistance as a rough surface increases it. Looking at the two incorrect answers, a pointy front is going to reduce friction rather than increase it. And of course, the colour of the car doesn't make any difference to its air resistance. OK, let's look at one more. The third friction question we'll look at is a bit different, as you have to match up characteristics of materials according to what they're used for. We're looking at two different cycling sports. Mountain biking, where you want lots of grip or friction to stay on the forest track. And then there's road cycling, which is more about out and out speed. Your job is to look at the materials characteristics and match them with what job they're doing. So, knobbly wide tyres, high or low friction? High, it's a rough, bumpy surface, so that's going on the mountain bike. That means that smooth, narrow tyres offer much lower friction, small area and smooth surface. So they're going on the road bike. Next, if your arms are tucked in on your bike, does that offer more or less resistance to the air? Or well, less. So that's the road racer. Finally, what do you think wearing loose clothing does for your air resistance? It increases it, doesn't it? That'll be the mountain biker's clothing then. Great. Well, hopefully you're getting the idea about friction better now. About how friction is part of air resistance and water resistance too and how to increase and how to reduce friction. Nice one. Let's recap what we set out to do today. How did you get on? Do you now understand what friction is and how it's caused? Have you been able to use that understanding to answer some questions? And have you had the opportunity to explain the idea of friction to someone else? If you've met one or all of these objectives, that's brilliant. Well done. Remember, with new or challenging topics, practice really does make perfect. If you'd like to practice these skills further, why not try these activities that we've picked out for you? As we finish up for today, here are other places you can find us or access support. We look forward to working with you again soon and keep practicing in the meantime.